In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It's a joy and an honor for Linda and me to be back with you here tonight at St. Paul's, have a chance to worship with you and to gather around word and sacrament and to celebrate God's love working in our lives in so many different ways. I was intrigued by the sermon series when Pastor C sent me the information originally about the impact, the impact of the Apostle Paul and his work and his teachings. And then he told me now your title is impact when people don't get it. And he gives, and the, the text which we heard tonight from Acts chapter 14 is the opportunity for Paul and Barnabas to be traveling on the first missionary journey of Paul. Uh, he had three of them before he went to Rome at the end, but Paul's first missionary journey, and as he's traveling from city to city, from town to town, and he would gather there to preach and to teach. The beginning of Acts chapter 14, we have Paul and Barnabas are in Iconium. And there it tells us that they went to the synagogue and Jews and Greeks alike believed in what Paul was teaching them about God's love in Jesus Christ. However, there were those disgruntled Jews, those leaders of the Jewish community and of the synagogue who didn't like what Paul was saying and doing and they began to stir up the people against them. And they began to cast doubt that Paul truly was a spokesman from God, and they began to raise all kinds of anxiety. And so we find that, that the un, it says in there, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds and Paul and Barnabas remained there and continued to preach and teach until they finally are run out of town. They have to leave for their own safety. And then they come, as we heard in our text for tonight, to Lystra. And there in Lystra, we, we can sort of assume that that was more of a Greek Gentile community. We don't have a talk about a synagogue there like we had, but rather we have a temple to Zeus, the Greek god. And as Paul is preaching and teaching this beautiful scene, we don't really know what he saw, but he saw the man sitting there in front of him who was, had been lame from birth. He had never walked. And Paul said, I mean, Luke says in the text, Paul saw in that man that he had faith to be healed. He must have really been listening or intent on what Paul was saying there in his message. And so Paul says to the man, get up. And what I love about miracles of healing in the New Testament, the healing is instant. It says the man jumped up and started walking. It wasn't like he had to work his way up, like his legs were weak because he'd never but he was instantly healed, and he jumps up in a miraculous way. Now, the people, being good Greeks, being Gentiles, who the Greek gods make an assumption. They said, look at this. The gods have come down to us in the form of man. And they named Barnabas Hermes, and they named Paul Zeus, because that's all they knew. They knew God as the Greek gods. And what do you do for Greek gods when, when they come into your presence or when you want to appease them? You offer sacrifices. And so the people don't understand what Paul's talking about, certainly don't understand the God of Jesus Christ, but they see and understand that these are Greek gods who've become human. And so they bring their sacrifices before Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, of course, are distraught. So distraught that they rip their clothes, a sign sometimes in the scriptures of repentance, but sometimes a sign of being disturbed or upset, but they rip their clothes trying to emphasize to these people that they are not Greek gods, 
but they are representative of the one God. So Paul tries to explain it by going back to creation. He says, I'm here to tell you about the God who created. And the God who has cared for you all these years by providing rain and crops for your life. But they don't understand. They only get it from their own background, their own perspective. And they are, tr- they are trying to understand this as they only know how, as Greeks. Now we're told, some come to believe and understand, but again, we have the, the, the Jews who come down from Iconium and begin to disturb the crowds and dis- disrupt them and create all kinds of suspicion about Paul and Barnabas, and eventually they stone him because they don't get it. As hard as Paul is, as articulate as Paul is in his teaching, there is this total misunderstanding at this particular point of his message because they see them from a Greek perspective. In Paul's, in our second reading that we read in Paul's writing there in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, the God of this world blinds those who don't believe. That remember, remember that we are in a war. That we not only have a God who loves us and cares for us in Jesus Christ, but we have the God of this world, whom we call Satan, who is constantly at work to disrupt, who is constantly at work to distract, who is constantly at work to keep people from knowing who Jesus is. And so we see that that Paul makes the point in his 2 Corinthians that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is blind to those who don't see, those who are blinded by the God of this world. Now all that sets the stage then for us tonight to ask the question, so what? What's the impact for us as we think about people who don't get it. We live in a world today where people don't get it. We live in a world today where people see things very different than we do. Let me just give you a couple of examples how this works. A few months ago, my wife was having a conversation with one of the members of of one of our churches, and he said, isn't Honda, a wonderful Christian organization. And she said, and why do you think Honda is a wonderful Christian company? Well, because they're always doing little acts of kindness. And that's their marketing. And all these wonderful, wonderful little acts of kindness from Little League baseball players to people who need help and you hear it on the radio, isn't that a wonderful Christian thing to do? Well, it's Christ-like, but there's nothing Christian about Honda. I don't know anything about their leadership, but there's nothing Christian about their commercials. It is simply little acts of kindness. But we, because we see that through the eyes of believers, we see that as acts of Christian love. Because of our background. Because of who we are. Or another example. We once in a while watching an athletic event, whether it be a football game or basketball game or baseball game, We'll hear athletes give all glory and credit to God. Now, we as Christians immediately think they're giving glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to Jesus. But that may not be true. That may not be their God. Now, Albert Pujols hit another home run today while he was in St. Louis, and Albert Pujols, when he hits a home run, always points up 
to heaven as he crosses home plate because we know he's a very strong Christian man. And he gives credit to God. But, but we, we see the world through our eyes. We see activity through our eyes because we see them through the eyes of Jesus. Now, how does the world see us? How does the world see the church? We oftentimes think, you know, that people don't come to church because they just don't want to. If they wanted to come to church, they'd come to church. And yet the reality is that many of the people who drive by this church on a daily basis have no idea why you're here. Oh, maybe they think because of a wonderful school. That's why you're here. But people today who are not in the church oftentimes have no idea what the church stands for or they have a very negative idea of what Christians stand for. Because all they ever hear is what the church is against and not what the church is for. They don't get it. And so we, we struggle with this. How do we help people understand who Jesus is? I don't know how many times people have said to me, you know, Pastor, I've invited my neighbor to go to church, but they never come. I don't understand. But you see, they don't get it. Like the people who heard Paul and Barnabas, they don't understand why you go to church. Or they don't understand why they should go to church because they don't see the church through the eyes of Jesus. The challenge that we have as the people of God is to point them to Jesus. Not to us, not to our church, but to Jesus. We have a God who loves us so much we have a God who cares for us so much. And that's what Paul was trying to teach the people there that day. He was trying to lead them to the point of introducing them to Jesus. We have a God who is so special, and Paul knew that firsthand. Paul, who was, as he describes himself, chief of sinners, Paul, who had been the rebellious one, the enemy of the church, who becomes the apostle, knew what Jesus had done for him. We have a God who loves us so much that he sends his own son for us. We come to church tonight on a Saturday night when we could be doing something else because we've met Jesus. Whether we met him at the cradle or whether we met him at the empty tomb, we have a Jesus who loves us so much. And that's what we're trying to help people understand. That the church is here to introduce people to Jesus. Now, Christ knew how hard that was going to be. Christ knew how hard that was going to be for his disciples to try to live out that witness in their life. That what does he do? On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body and for you. And he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, take and drink, this is my cup given for you. The very same meal that he gives to us tonight. The very same meal that he gave to those disciples on Monday, Thursday, just before they were going to see him die on the cross. Is the meal he gives to you and to me that we might see the power of God working in our life, the love of God working for us. And we become then his witnesses. A recent study of the United States found that half, half of all people living in the United States today are members Christian church, a Jewish synagogue, or a mosque. Half of all people living in the United States today are a member of one of those three 
religious groups. That means that less than half are members of a Christian church because they don't know Jesus, because they don't get it, because they don't understand the power of God's love in their life, because they don't understand a God who cares for them so much that he sends his son. And so God uses us in our discipleship. God uses us in our daily lives to be the ones to help introduce people to Jesus. And we do that when we offer to pray with a neighbor who's struggling, who may not know Jesus, but we offer to pray for them. When we reach out to somebody in our family who is going through tremendous anxiety and offer to care for them, we reach out to a co-worker or to somebody in school and let them know that we pray for them. When we do those acts of kindness, not in the name of Honda, but in the name of Jesus. And when we pray for people, to pray for them in the name of Jesus, God's love for us. You see, people don't get it. If people got it, the church would be full. If people got it, we wouldn't be dealing with a lot of the issues we deal with in our culture and our society today. So Paul stands up strong. And later on, Paul is going to write to Timothy from prison shortly before he dies. And he says, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, I have run the course, this has laid up for me the crown of righteousness which God gives to me. So Paul becomes for us a model. When people don't get it, don't get discouraged. When people don't get it, don't wonder why, but rather be Jesus to them. Be there. For you only understand once you meet Jesus.